Um, so thank you all for being here, and thank you especially to Omar and the Sharjah Out Foundation. And um, it's been an amazing biennial, and this is the second half of the third day of the March meeting. Um, so as is the etiquette here, um, we're not going to do biographies. You can find them in the March meeting information. And I will not be doing a lengthy introduction, which is great for me. Um, so the panel topic today is, what does it mean to make new time? A question um, that we are asking very much in the context of the question of the whole biennial, which is leaving the echo chamber. And so this panel is coming from a range of individual perspectives, which is based on their practice areas and their references. Um, and they are curators, artists, architects, and beyond. I don't know what beyond means in this context, but maybe we'll find out. Um, so as the moderator, um, I'd like to invite us all, or perhaps give us permission if you like, to revel in an element of randomness or disorder, perhaps. Um, so we can look for connections, uh, for commonalities, for answers, perhaps. But maybe it's also possible to leave with everything largely unresolved, to in fact avoid tidy conclusions that ultimately lead us back to, you've guessed it, the echo chamber. So let's go straight into the presentation provocations. Um, and we're going to start, first of all, with Aram Meshedi. So Aram. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. August 23rd, 2013, David Anton, the late artist and innovator of the talk poem, a kind of hybrid form of spoken word, stream of consciousness monologue, and real-time art criticism, to which today's genre of the lecture performance is almost entirely indebted, produced Writing in the Dark, a characteristically meandering piece that was delivered in front of an audience in San Diego, California, and subsequently edited for publication in Anton's typically anti-punctuational, anti-grammatical style. 2013 would have been three years before Anton died at the age of 84, and after several years of, having, uh, live, of living with Parkinson's disease. Here is Anton in his words. How much of life is not contingent? As poet artists, we have to deal with contemporary contingencies. They come up. We deal with them badly or well, but these contingencies are there and we can't control them. But we can resist. I resist being old, I resist having Parkinson's disease, and I will resist until they kill me. This is probably the best we can do, is to fight a retreating battle. In this sense, art is a kind of war against annihilation. We tend to struggle against annihilation. We struggle for life. We struggle for life whether we're painting a simple glass or whether we're trying to map something unmappable. Whether we're uh, presenting something different and totally beyond the range of our capabilities, I usually feel that I'm working beyond the range of my capabilities so that I'm not surprised I feel that we do the best we can, which, as I've said before, is all an artist can do, is to do the best we can. Anton, until his final moments, resisted the certainty of death, and the work he produced over his lifetime prolongs this resistance beyond our present moment further still. The enduringness of an artist's body of work in whatever form it may take offers a way to consider what it might mean to make new time what it might mean to elongate an experience that elapses according to a different temporal logic, one that needn't necessarily be concise, finite, resolute, or linear. In the context of making new time, I'm reminded also of the late Michael Asher and his legendary post-studio seminars at the California Institute of the Arts, which from 1976 to 2008 sought to, in his words, quote, take the clock out of the class classroom, by subjecting a single artist's work to a rigorous and exhaustive six hour or more critique. Given how little time the average viewer spends with a work of art in an exhibition today, 30 seconds by most accounts, Asher's post-studio class would be tantamount to torture for even those who claim to enjoy art or for those of us who treat it as a vocation. In their lifetime, 
How many times will an artist hear from a curator, how long is it, or can you send me the link? Questions like these are the result of there ironically not being enough time to watch or to see, let alone experience the quantity of works produced by artists for exhibitions such as the one we've convened around today. Yet despite the lack of enough waking hours, the apparent shortening of attention spans, professional or otherwise, and the apparent fickleness of tastes based on so-called appeals to timeliness or relevance or being of the moment, Artists continue to make things that have the capacity to radically alter the experience of time and in some respects stand outside of time, which is not to resuscitate the dead idea that works of art are by their nature timeless. Instead, I want to briefly take this opportunity to consider the material encounter with the paintings of Lebanese artist Uget Kaland in the context of Omar Khalif's exhibition, Making New Time, as evidence of another variety of resistance. Kalan's biographic details are an essential part of this experience. Knowing, for instance, that she was the daughter of the first president of Lebanon following the end of the French mandate, that she allowed herself to be an artist only after her father's death in 1964, that she left her children and family in Beirut in 1970 to pursue an artistic life, that she was preoccupied with her physical weight, that she designed caftans for Pierre Cardin after the designer spotted her in one of his Paris showrooms when she was buying a tie for her husband, Paul, that she again settled in Los Angeles in 1987 after the death of her lover, Georges Apostu, that previous year, or that her exhibition history hardly compares to her output. These and other anecdotes like them make up the life of Kaland, who as an artist and persona has always managed to elide the preoccupations of art's linear histories, whether they be the characterizations of Arab modernism or a West Coast sensibility in Los Angeles, and who only recently has managed to have her life's work considered in the context of exhibitions such as this one. Hers and other work like hers that fall outside of the critical categories of global art discourse and that unbind themselves from the dominant trends of fashionable geographies, marketable identities, and historical fetishes participate in this activity of making new time. It is not so much a gesture that is housed within the acceleration or deceleration of the art viewing experience experience by, say, slowing down to the seemingly anachronistic velocity of paint on canvas or oil on panel or pencil on paper, as it is the rate at which a lifetime of work unfolds, how it quietly resists and how it wages a retreating battle against the asymmetrical decay and the thrust of life toward death that is important here. I am admittedly skeptical of the idea that art makes new time because art by and large functions according to the reliable clock of capital on the one hand and the clock of intellectual trends very much rooted in specific moments in time on the other hand. But if we are to trace the path of Kalan's practice and her willful removal from discursive frameworks, opting instead for a theory of sensuality and sexuality through paint, for an erotics of line, then it might become more productive to consider how meaningful it is to be out of step with the speed of one's current moment. In some cases, recognition may come too late if it comes at all. Perhaps as an artist, you've been invited to the party, but this is not to say that you will be invited again. Perhaps the personal, local, or individual concerns of one's practice that are applicable today will have little weight tomorrow. Perhaps the style of your research has fallen victim to the whims of institutional ideologies or biennial circuits. These are concerns that underlie most forms of making for artists that artists in particular address within themselves each day. And yet there is an enduring, uh, an endurance that folds, unfolds according to a different clock that manifests itself according to a different notion of historical time that is decidedly incompatible with the discipline of art history or the field of curation. All an artist like Kaland can do is the best that she can. And all that we can do in response is to reorient our critical clocks and therefore change the rules of engagement and the narrative of art's so-called minor histories. Thank you.
Thank you, Aaron. And now, Zoe. So one of the um, three curators of the biennial, Zoe But. Thank you. And thank you to Omar for the invitation. I think I'd like to twist this question a little bit and ask, how do we find time? And suggest that there cannot be any new time, but instead we are in a space that we are constantly excavating. In the context of leaving the echo chamber, my own viewpoint here is the chamber that we have chosen to listen to, speak to, act within, only has a certain number of surfaces at the moment for its echo to resound. And for me, it is the minds and commitment of artists that open up those surfaces to give that diversity of the echo of human production more valency. To think about finding time and why I might want to twist it in this way. I live in a part of the world where time is fictionalized. Our histories are fictionalized. Our textbooks are not icons of truth. Our oral histories are being destroyed, forgotten. So time in itself is disappearing. So one question that artists quite constantly ask me is, how do I find that past? How do I find that fact? And so I've become quite interested in finding time. I'm particularly interested in how we find it on a local level. And this was prompted to me by a very dear friend, a previous boss, and who has become, in my mind, an underestimated thinker in China. His name is Lu Jie, co-founder of the Long March Project. I spent a great deal of my little time as an emerging young curator following his practice and came to love the fact I could spend three years working with him. We were traveling through rural China one day along the Yangtze River in the middle of nowhere where dates or a plenty in the middle of China. <laughs> and I said to him, what was it like growing up in the middle of the Cultural Revolution where you've got no access to the outside world, where there were no books, no media, no, no, no information coming in from the outside world? How did you learn? And he was smoking a cigarette and he took his time and he's puffing circles at me and I knew he was going to say something facetious. And he says, what on earth makes you think that I needed that outside world? Which got me thinking, okay, he's quite a socialist, nationalist, passionate thinker. Not quite communist, but nearly there. He said, how can you deny the fact that I come from Fujian, not Beijing? My father's a teacher. My mum comes from a farming background. My school teachers were agriculturalists, is that not of itself a comparative history that is teaching me of how to relate to the world? And he went on to tell me how he discovered the art of the letter, the literati, the idea that the text on a page in Chinese is not only a, a way of humans to communicate, but they're also images. Every single pictogram of the Chinese language is an image. And through that course of traveling along the Yangtze, I realized that too often when we think about finding time, we assume that it has to sit beyond ourselves. But in actuality, when I look at Lutier's life and what he went through, and how his mind has become honed in terms of how he defines what contemporary means in China, I realize it's because he has spent time with himself and he has fundamentally sat down and chosen to listen. And by that I mean he has listened to the way the wind blows in his bedroom at night and thinks, why is that warm right now? He will sit down and share a cup of tea with me in the middle of the most gorgeous tea fields in Hangzhou 
and he will be able to tell me why the smell of this particular tea is different to another. And I understand that those particular attention spans that he gives to those small moments is what makes his criticality refreshing and indeed makes that echo of the chamber that we assume so much richer. And as a consequence of my being able to spend just those four years with him, I realize that I've come to respect the patterns of artists' behavior in how they produce. And for me, that comes from listening. It comes from spending time in artist studios and not talking. From sleeping in the same studios, not with them, but... <laughs> I've gotten drunk, cooked. There's been tears, there's been fights, there's been all sorts of moments, but every single up and down, positive and negative, has been about paying attention to the little things, the finger gestures, the way that someone will smoke a cigarette in a particular way. And they may, this may all sound rather superfluous, but I think when it comes to bodies of knowledge in the world, we are stuck at the moment in how we are sharing that knowledge. And as a curator who works in a part of the world where we have heavy censorship, it isn't easy to display, it's often Every single show I do is censored by the government, really. So as a consequence, I've come to really appreciate invisibility and the assumptions that gestures are not always what they seem. And I think that if you look through the platform, at least, of what I've managed to co put out for this biennial, I hope that what you walk away with is an understanding that histories is about finding time. It's not new time, they have always been there, but we just need to pay particular attention to them. Thank you, Zoe. <laughs> okay, and next, Karai Duman. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I also want to thank Omar for inviting me here. I'm a practicing, <coughs> practicing architect in New York City so I, I'm, you know, will be talking from an architect's point of view on this. Um, and I just want to show you some first some kind of statics um, to start the talk. Um, so this is just recent divide. I was looking into this uh, echo chamber idea and finding time. I find this um, the average American adult spends 54 minutes a day commuting more than 11 hours a day staring at screens, has 1.4 friends and 338 Facebook friends. Um, oh. On top of it, uh, uh, among these 11 hours, we spent 5.6 hours of it browsing images, and we approximately see 1,560 images per hour and 8,500 images per day. Um, the reason this was really interesting for me is that I, I think echo chambers were always there. In the previous talk, we you know, listened to prehistoric where you know, there was the who that prevented us to come out of our echo chamber that we were afraid that we just have to stay. So the echo chamber is not something uh, new. But I think one thing that I, I started to think about in my practice is that you know, there's, this, um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of attention given to dissemination of information and dissemination of images. And there's, uh, especially as a special practice in architecture, in the past decade, a lot of focus was given off on to disseminating images. Whereas I start to think about, is there a way to shift the focus to creating spaces that are uh, spaces for production of culture or production of narratives? And that, and that spaces can be digital or physical um, or other ways. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of something that I just want to briefly talk about. So in the past five years, in my practice, we have been doing some research and design projects that are trying to create some social infrastructures in New York City. And then maybe a commonality between them is that they are all looking into existing but overlooked infrastructures or communities 
or underutilized structures. Um, and usually the proposals try to look into things that are strangely familiar, that creates open-ended frameworks. They are flexible but not generic, and they are ideally uh, participatory. So I just want to, and in the catalog I have a project from an earlier uh, uh, years, but just a recent one that I want to quickly go through that we did with um, New York City Department of Design and Construction, which is about scaffoldings. Um, so I want to first maybe, so the, the uh, sorry, so maybe briefly talk about that. It's very interesting. People think that scaffoldings are just for new buildings and new construction. But in 1980s, there was a series of incidents where New York City created this law that if your building is from the first century of the 20th century or earlier, every, and it's about six stories high, every six years you need to have a facade inspection. So a majority of the buildings in New York City every six years has to have scaffoldings that go up to do this facade inspection. What it ends up being is that this is where my office is located. At any given time, 20 to 25 percent of sidewalks are covered with scaffoldings. So the kind of interesting that I start to talk about is that how, you know, if it's such a part of our everyday life and our public space, that it's not actually sufficient enough just to use it for security, that it needs to have other things, other means um, for people to use. Um, so basically, I just don't want to go through the whole thing, but maybe, oh, oh. So what we start to think about is that is there ways that we start to think about public furniture or plug-in furniture or plug-in different kind of things that actually start make these scaffoldings be usable for people. Um, so these are, maybe I'll just quickly go through, if I can, yeah. So these are some of the scaffolding proposals that we did for the New York City that actually provides um, um, some kind of space for people to occupy in the sidewalk. Another thing interesting about sidewalks is that sidewalks are always associated with the, with the, the, the roads, where roads are always tend to be, you know, you drive from one place to another, from A to B. You don't really never occupy the road. It's always transitional. And sidewalks are in New York City always tend to be this kind of transitional spaces that in a way these are kind of attempts to create some sort of spaces that you can spend time and actually create public spaces. They are actually public, but they are not used for public. So, um, and this is another option that we did for, for the city. I guess, yeah. Thank you. That was the Thank you, Karai. And so next, Todd Rice. Thank you. Uh, like Karai, I'm an, I'm an architect. And for better, and sometimes for worse, I was trained to give you advice. So when preparing my thoughts for today, I suddenly had a sparkle of a realization. I realized I could offer some tangible advice about today's theme of making time. And here's my advice. You should become an architect. Because you see, the, arch the practice of architecture never gave up on its progressive ideals. Other professions rejected pronouncements that history is this story of undeterred progress, but not architecture. It's still very much a positivist practice. To become an architect is to sign the pact that the world is your problem and that you are its solution. In this way, the encounters between problem and solution ride confidently on a wave of time, the tick-tock, tick-tock kind of time that the clockmaker's clock makes. To believe in architecture is to assert that time is only linear, and that comes with all sorts of wonderful comforts. You can leave horrid things behind, and you can look forward to beautiful things ahead. In other words, if all goes according to plan, you will be making time. The great chronicler of science, James Glick, recently reminded us that time can only occur if change occurs. And change, Glick observes, can only be perceived spatially. If change is necessarily spatial, then time only happens if space says it can. Since time can only be read through space, and since architects can shape space, 
One would think then that the architect is engaged in moving time along. Creating space for the sake of time might have been a way for architecture to, to set signposts for the ages, to connote milestones in human-built history, and to present them as our own contributions to the, to the earth. As the philosopher Stephen Fogel asserts, since we human beings are of the earth, then our creations, and that being our reproductive creations, but also our productive creations, are also of the earth. But architecture, it didn't turn out that way. For more than a decade, I've examined the production of cities here in the Gulf region, and principally the city of Dubai. I've done this by chronicling the role of the architect as a profession not simply imported, but transformed through the global trade of consulting services. If you are somewhat familiar with the cities of the UAE, then you've surely heard eye-roll-inducing platitudes like Dubai or whichever city has achieved in 10 years what other cities could never have achieved in 30 or 50 years. This song has been sung since the 1970s. You've probably heard it recently in a CNN commercial, and if you've flown in to Sharjah for the, these events, you've probably heard it on an in-flight video on Emirates. If the cities of the UAE supposedly produce in 10 years what other cities do in 30 to 50 years, then what do they do with this extra time gained? Have they made time for themselves? Let's see production in terms of infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean just about any hardening of extracted raw materials into hardened shells for urbanization. So mixed-use development projects, roadways, ports, desalination plants, cultural institutions, etc. Infrastructural development is often considered forward-looking. Forward-looking in the sense that calculations today bring, bring improvements tomorrow. But progress usually does not get enacted as the architect or planner plans it uh, through her rational, delineated schedules. Instead, according to the anthropologist Akhil Gupta, Creating infrastructure makes time lumpy. Projects are defined by a medley of ravenous terms and conditions, which are not on the same steady wavelength as engineered or designed time. Investors in infrastructure do not invest because they see a future in a project. They see a profit in it. For them, the future is measured not in time, but in adjusted rates. Investors and their prescribed loan periods force smooth processes of design into lumpy payment options. And so after the loan period is set, design and construction are shaped by a deadline. Deadlines lead to what Akhil Gupta calls dead time. It's a race to the finish in order to make something stand monumentally still. From the perspective of the debtor, infrastructure is a rejection of the ephemeral and the flighty. Time gets killed in the process. Infrastructure is permanence. It's being without time. Of course, it doesn't work out that way. Modernization might be delivered with the promise of permanence, but really, it delivers new kinds of time, schedules of maintenance, threats of decay, and of course, the anticipation of inevitable expansions. We know that contractors love to announce that projects are ahead of schedule, that they are beating time. But what happens when the progressive, confident time of the architect gets compressed into the accelerated, greedy time of being ahead of schedule? Is the rush just the theatricality or the balahu of marketing to keep us focused and simultaneously addled by the rehearsal of compressed time? Might it be that space, in this case a city, is so concerned about what time might bring if it were not whipped into a wizardry of transformation? Is the compression of time proportional to the acts of pressing powdery and wet construction materials into hardened forms of inhabitation? Is compression of time a delusional awareness of time that it has to be shaped as much as the space onto which it is applied. Architecture is a way out of the so-called echo chamber. That is, if you fully give over 
to its ideology. If you wake up from this ideology, you will find that the steadiness and assertive calculations of the architect are eventually co-opted by developers to make their point. And that point is that time needs to be cut up, splintered, and distracted to make time stop. More often than not, architects are paid to use their rationality not to reveal time's movement, but to stop it. As if just a little more concrete could guarantee that things will not drift away. My professional kin and I are paid to reshape this planet, but if you pay us enough, we might figure out a way to make the planet stop, to make the Earth stop in time. Stopping the Earth would make it uninhabitable, but if progress is shackled to a simplistic understanding of time, maybe stopping the Earth would engage us with more flexible notions of time. If we are no longer bound to Earth, we are no longer beholden to its measurable cycles, like days, lunar phases, years, and shipping cycles. If we cannot count the cycles, then time becomes countless. We won't then be, need to make time because we will have so much of it in our hands. Thank you, Sharjah Foundation, for having me. Thank you to Omar for the invitation to be here. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Todd. OK, and last but my no means least, it's Reem Fada. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Shaja Art Foundation and Omar, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, time has always been an obsession for me, thanks to Susan Buck Morris, who is here with us, and you, you have the pleasure of hearing her tomorrow. Um, I, I've been personally uh, kind of obsessing about a specific idea um, that was, I was hoping taking me away from time and then brought me back to time. And, um, and it is uh, really this constant nagging of verifying this idea of materialization. So as a, as a kind of methodology or process of formulating a new language. I read a poem recently and it made a lot of sense to me um, by Naira Wahid in her book, Salt. Can we speak in flowers? It will be easier for me to understand a new language. And for me, that idea was very potent. How do we formulate a language based on materialization? Um, and, 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 and no reductionism. Veering away from a language of abstraction, uh, a formulation of something that is um, enriched, has components, is embodied, uh, provides for uh, dimensions, but is radically very much like us. Blood, bones, um, has, uh, has depths to it. What is that kind of language of materialization in, um, in, in various kind of ways of seeing life? So how do we go away from this abstracted abstracted kind of concept? Um, uh, how do we move away from the reductionism of markets, um, from numbers that refer to human beings? How do we go away from formulations of laws that are also abstracted and therefore reduce lives? Um, and how do we then find a way to create this kind of affinity? Of course, art has a measure of looking at things into this material forms, but how do we extend those material forms into various kind of forms of law, knowledge and making? How do we break our own bubble? And how do we manifest that kind of materialization later? And I think also that materialization needs to extend to time. We need to stop to refer to time as an abstraction as a numerical. There has to become an understanding of time that is material. 
that is not the idea of a continuum, that it's materialization. Time in a material way. Time in a, uh, in a multi-dimensional way that really has the capturing of material essence. How do we arrive at a materialization of time, a non-abstracted form of time? And then how do we give it back to people? I think, I mean, for me, particularly, I was looking at one painting by an artist, uh, and it's always a painting that's haunted me for quite a long time, by Shakir Hassan Al Said, uh, uh, an Iraqi painter who um, lived, uh, was one of the very kind of pivotal artists in the modern period in Iraq, um, the building of the nation, uh, uh, and part of several modern art movements that happened in Iraq. Uh, but he kind of broke off and did his own, uh, uh, I want to say, art manifesto. And he arrived at a, a deeper kind of understanding for himself uh, uh, and wrote this manifesto called the One Dimension Group. Um, and it was looking at references, and this was in 71. And he was looking at, uh, I hope I'm not mistaken if it was 71 or later. And he was looking at a larger kind of phenomenological understanding of material space and time. And, and he produced a series of paintings, and he was in conversation in his mind with T Antonius Tapias and other artists. And for him, he, he produced a series of paintings that look as if they're like graffiti. They're layered and layered cement and wood, um, uh, layered paintings that have texturality and they have also language, like graffiti, built on numericals that are also built on these kind of, uh, on these layers of his painting. Interestingly enough, I encountered one years ago that had the words, from 71, that had the words liberty and, uh, liberty and, and spring. And that for me really and, and that was a moment that we were coming out of in the Arab world. But for me, that flattening, that moment where that painting was able to capture um, even a, a sort of a, a reconnaissance, a going away from time into something even further, um, is a haunting. And, and that created a non-hierarchical even aspect of, in, in, our, in our ideas of like history going back into history. We always want to go back into history or referencing history as even better than the moment, that kind of nostalgia. But what if we do away with all of these hierarchies? What is the ability of language, of material language, of a material manifestation of time to break these hierarchies and help us see a different kind of interpretation for people and human lives around us? That's my interjection. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. Okay, so I'll start by asking a few questions, but then I'm going to open up to you. So do have a think what you want to ask or comment on. Um, uh, earlier, Koyo referred to the advice she had received on panels to speak about what you want. So um, I decided that I'm going to ask the questions that I want rather than the ones that I feel I should. Um, so I sort of threw away all the questions, most of them have been asked anyway already, um, and came up with some new ones this morning. Um, so first of all, I was thinking about what Omar said in terms of create dangerously. Um, particularly uh, via Jean Fisher, the notion of nothing is forgiven. Um, and this idea of the, or a responsibility of artists and artistic creation. So I wanted to start with a question, how do you understand or interpret the idea of responsibility um, within your work or your practice or your examples? Would anyone like to begin? <laughs> Zoe. Omar dobbed me in. <laughs> um. I guess responsibility is something I think a lot about as someone who left the museum world some 10 years ago. 
to go and work with artists and help artists build spaces and build networks, communities, so that art and culture can thrive. And in amongst that move, that transition away from museum practice, it was a really big question of responsibility. And uh, Amar and I have had conversations about this before. As a curator working for artists, that's again a particular relationship. I'm not working with them. They're not working for me. I'm working for artists. My responsibility is to honour the longevity of space that allows their intent to survive, which means thinking about long-term publics, which means thinking about their emotional relationship to the work that they do, which means respecting the context that they have chosen to focus. In my own work, that context, as I mentioned earlier, is very fraught. It's a social political landscape of vagueness. That vagueness is unpredictable, without guideline, often incredibly psychologically damaging breeds self-censorship, hinders desire to learn. My own sense of responsibility there is to ensure that I advocate for the role of artists in society. How I do that, I'm still unraveling. I would say that that is my daily challenge, is to how to ensure that advocacy has on generations, other people to carry the baton. And that's a tough one, because I have to engage with wealth. I have to engage, often in my context, with colonial forms of capital that refuse to trust new markets, with education systems of nothing, and I mean that in, in sincerity, I mean nothing. No money, no intelligence, no direction. That sounds bleak, but I can tell you it's anything but. The artists that I work with are phenomenal, and it's to them that I am indebted for my ongoing commitment to curating, because institutions, I'll be honest, nearly killed it. So I'll end there by saying that uh, ethical responsibilities for me are incredibly important. I think we don't think enough about our ethical speech. And just to defend Omar, he didn't um, dub you in. I'm, I'm just very perceptive. Um, OK, Karai. No, I just want to, <coughs> I mean, I have a, <coughs> a designer's practice is very different than artists because we kind of get briefs. We don't create them. But I think one thing as a responsibility in these kind of projects is usually there's this notion of, you know, there's a problem and architects are the creative solvers or bring creative answers, whereas there's this idea of, you know, there's, there's an enormous creativity of asking the right question or seeing the right thing to ask the right question. So most of the, the, the things that we try to work on in a way is my, I see my responsibility is to be able to shift the practice that you are not waiting for somebody's question that, you know, our cities need creative thinking to ask the right questions. Um, and the design solution later is something a lot of people can answer very well, but, you know, to, to be able to have the creative thinking in different ways is, is something very important. Anyone else like to address the question? Oh, okay, uh, so my next question is, again, thinking about the idea of danger, I started to think about fear um, and potentially how um, this keeps us in the so-called echo chambers or echo chamber. Um, and 
various fears. So fear perhaps of not belonging, of not understanding, uh, of not having the answers, fear of asking stupid questions. That's me today. Um, fear of making assumptions. And so I wanted to ask the panel if they have any strategies, personal or professional, um, for overcoming fear. Aram? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've just given you the fear, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't thought about it before, I guess. I mean, I live in fear constantly. Uh, I don't know why I'm here at the moment. The, f kind of the, the, the fear of not belonging is very real and tangible um, for me. But it's also, I think, in part because, you know, my understanding of the role and responsibility that I've been put in, in this capacity to kind of uh, think about art and the work of artists is to hopefully oftentimes get things wrong um, and it's not in the kind of like interpersonal relationships because as Zoe said these are quite important to the, the work that one does in this field but I think that um, my frustration often is that people aren't afraid enough because they speak with such exuberant confidence uh, about their abilities uh, especially curators uh, which is amazing to me because the the field is so messed up in so many ways and yet the curators that I know in large part seem to think that they're not the problem um, and they are myself included uh, so that's something that I would you know kind of want to instill a little bit more of uh, sense of fear <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> Um, Todd, perhaps? You did say that you gave out advice, so overcoming fear. I was being ironic. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the only thing that comes to mind is, uh, to that question is, is I'm not a very good counselor in, in handling fear, uh, but I do deal with other people's fear quite often, and that's, those are students. Uh, I teach architecture uh, master's program, and um, while I respect Karai's answer to the last question, I think it's, you know, questions aren't actually what you get paid uh, to do. You are, just as in the architecture studio uh, of school, as in the profession, you are required to come with a solution. And I think there's uh, a heightened awareness in the last several years. I don't know if people care about architectural design here, but uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a poignant awareness that uh, providing answers is essentially a top-down process. And I have been noticing that students being very troubled by this, but also being excited by it, about it at the same time. And I've started to see this very strange process that I, I haven't really, I can't find an equivalent to it in any other uh, profession. And that is that architects, students begin to make the solutions but also to try to foresee that there will be a force that will oppose it. Like they, they design in order to hope that someone will break it. And I find that a really kind of troubling, but also kind of very much inspiring uh, position to be in. Thank you. And um, Reem, I'd like to ask you something different. Um, you mentioned a word that I had thought about a little bit over the last few days that hasn't come up very often, um, the word nostalgia. Um, and through various kind of ideas of loss, of ruins, of archaeology that have been mentioned over the last few days, I wonder if you could just expand a little bit on how you feel about nostalgia and perhaps some of the, the dangers of it. I did want to talk about fear for a second. Oh, please do. <laughs> if you don't mind. Because I thought, I thought that was intriguing. Um, uh, I, I personally think, and, and something you're saying also, Todd, which is, I think we're all very fearful at this moment. I hope that there's a, a sense of this impending doom that is there. And I hope that this fear is 
what is channeling a lot of what we are hopefully trying to attain in the cultural sphere and as artists and as people that operate on a level of responsibility because it is, and the most, for me, and this is something that I've um, also kind of ref referencing what you're saying, Aram, is not the confidence, but it's really trying to arrive at answers because I'm sick of the questions. I'm sick of constantly asking questions without arriving at tangible solutions. I need to see tangible tangibility in our lives. I, we need to see art, articulations that are saying this is an attempt at an answer. It has doubt, of course. Nothing is finite without its, without its manifestations of you know, humanitarian doubt, fear, and all of it. But this is it. This is m my possibility of arriving at this kind of tangibility and answers. I would like to see more of that. I don't want the critical cycle, you know, that we kind of spurn at one another from the asking and the asking, oh, but I'm just here to ask the question and pose the question. No, I want the betterment of lives. I want to see them. I want to see the frameworks. I, I, that's why I'm invested in artists that create matter and look at these kind of articulations. So that's something that for me is very, on a very personal level, that's something that I'm, I'm finding my own frustrations, my own fears at, you know, am I really breaking these kind of limitations? Am I, am, am I an embodiment of my own fear of abstractions and all of that? This is something that is a reality. And to answer you, to your question about nostalgia, and, 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 and in my kind of, interjection, I was trying to say that, uh, I mean, of course people, I, I would say that I, I wouldn't think of an existence of nostalgia if there was a new formulation where you don't have ruins, you know, we don't have excess, right? You don't have a building that becomes an excess. Everything is in lived. There's a sense of responsibility in inhabiting. Uh, there is no, it's not about recycling. There's not something that becomes waste for you to say, oh, the nostalgia of that or how I could use that. I think there is a level in, we need to break that nostalgia because it is about a hierarchy of forms and a hierarchy of how we look at materials around us. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, does anyone have a question? Keen to check in if somebody wants to ask something. No? Okay. Um, another thing that I think um, kind of unites some of the things that um, you've been talking about and some of the experiences that we have is an idea of travel and traveling. Um, I think it does impact on sort of all the areas in which we work, but how do you feel it impacts on the kind of grander questions of today? So how does this idea of travel, traveling, um, how does it um, deal with the echo chamber? How does it support it or, um, you know, reject it in any way? What are your thoughts on travel? You've all <laughs> traveled here. <laughs> so we... um, well, I think for the most part, most of the globe can't travel. I think that's where we should probably give recognition that most of the world's population are hindered from movement and that the majority of the systems of distribution are created by those that do have access. Um, I think if we think about curating uh, as a field that I would say we're the largest carbon consumers on the planet, both curators and artists, because the nature of the work seems to be the more global you are on a CV, the more palatable you are to the next event. 
Uh, it's largely those facts that drove me to somewhat eject out of the exhibition system, I have to admit, because this biennial is the first major show that I've, I've ever done. So it was a, a real surprise when Hor asked me if I would be interested. But that exit out of the exhibition system for me was important. It was somewhat of a denial to me I was denying the travel. I couldn't afford it. I wanted to commit to a local community. That's not to say that I, am, I did invite many people to come to me, but I wanted to experience sitting still in that way of learning. Um, and I guess that sitting still and learning and deciding that the world offers so many tools for us to be able to learn time now. Is it possible that I can sit still and still engage and create a network and still learn and access? And I realise it is possible. But one cannot deny the physicality of experience in another site and in another place. And that's the anomaly, that's the contradictions of culture, that that physicality, that relational experience is absolutely crucial to giving respect to difference. So how we engage or measure or articulate or record those differences, that's what we, that's what curators do, that's what architects do, that's what writers, we, that's the job in my mind. All right. I think there's a you know, travel, traveling is you know there's there's the traveling of the bodies there's the traveling of the ideas there's the traveling of you know uh, you know information and but I think in in our practice which I hopefully told you will chip into there, there's also this danger because we I mean especially looking at the videos that Todd showed there's this idea of travel and bring your ideas and implement your ideas and our practices unfortunately unfortunately not that ephemeral. So you bring ideas and you implement within this very limited time frame. It's, it's, it's itself is still problematic. And I don't know how our practice can go around it and what it can do to kind of create a, a better practice so that you, know, you are not, like travel in our practice is imposing in sometimes, you know, and that's like what, how do you, how do you get, every, while you are producing, how do you not impose is, 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 is something more difficult and complicated in architecture. Um, so in that sense, I find that, I, I mean, we all have that desire, you know, to, 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 to build out there, but that's like, that's still, I don't know the answer, but it is troubling. So, yeah. I, I agree with what Karaya said, um, but I'll, I'd like to address it from another point of view of, of, of the architect and maybe touch upon what uh, Zoe brought up the, basically the idea that it takes means to be able to travel. Um, but there are actually several hundred million people in the world today who do find the means somehow to travel because they feel the need to, whether, they're in, whether it's officially recognized in forced migration or economic migration, but essentially there's kind of, you know, if you, if you lift these kind of legal terms or UN agreed or internationally agreed terms, you would see just a kind of spectrum of accessibility to not only to wealth, but the ability to travel over borders. And I think that's something that uh, we as architects uh, really actually have trouble with uh, because we talk in terms of settlement. Uh, we see cities as places of, of being places where one stays uh, and, and doesn't move when actually cities are places of intensive migration, immigration and emigration. Um, and we are obviously going to be seeing this much more often uh, with you know, coastal, coastal cities, uh, which are traditionally where cities have been, are going to be increasingly finding themselves underwater. Bangladesh is just one example of, I think by something like 2030, 20% of Bangladesh's coast will be flooded. We actually need to begin to understand kind of what it, what it means to how we consider what a city is and, and how we design for those cities. 
But also I think, and, and I, I started really actually getting a lot from yesterday's talks about what community is. And I think what I would like to see is much more discussion about what community is when it's not necessarily attached to terms like land or to indigeneity. What happens when community arises from happenstance and need and love? Okay, Aram, did you have something to? Um, I mean, I don't know that what I would add so much. I mean, I do think that, of course, there is the, you know, in the way that being there or being present is like part of the the field again for curators that is a kind of an extension of maybe art historical research that has to do with engaging with primary sources. I find myself on that side of things becoming, you know, uh, quite committed to the idea that um, one needs to kind of experience things uh, rather than submit to the kind of demands of virtual curating. Uh, but I'm fully aware also how that's kind of attached to notions of a certain kinds of like art tourism that don't really fit well with or sit well with me as um, either. And, but it's interesting to think of why so many people also, tra like some of whom are in this room, traveled, you know, however far you did to come to an exhibition of this sort, um, and then again spend so little time with the, the objects. Uh, not to go back to that point, but it's like, what does one gain from that experience? And talk about the waste of a carbon footprint or the, you know, one's flight being put to, to um, bad use. But, um, yeah, I don't know. If that's, that's another, that's all I have to add on that. I'm going to interject, or unless someone else is going to speak. Well, the voice of? The voice of, voice from beyond. Uh, First of all, I want to ask the audience to wake up if you're asleep. Um, I know lunch is probably sitting in your stomach, but I think there, there, there are questions. You know, the conversations that we've been having at, behind, outside of these doors have been rich and full and textured. We just talked about a whole history of knowledge production, Hannah Feldman and I, when we were sitting outside of here, and I want you to bring those questions here. I just wanted to say, I don't know what I really want to say, but that you are all on this stage as a kind of open-ended algorithm. You're here because of your work. Um, you're here to pollute each other's minds in different ways and to create something cacophonous and confusing, something discordant, which I see is happening. There is, there is discord, there is resonance, and there is dissonance. But the thing that really I thought a lot about in relation to the context of this whole biennial in terms of how all three curators worked was this idea of contingency, this idea that everything that we do is contingent on extraneous factors, whether they be political, social, economic. And it feels like the most, it feels that we are in an era where we have lost control of the pieces that that enable us to tell and control specific narratives. So, and then I started to listen, and Reem, always Reem, you always fill me with such joy. Um, you said, you're sick and tired of, in a way, of asking the question, which you're right, we are too often cop out by simply asking the question. So what I want to ask all of you is, haha. <laughs> Um, or pose is, well then how do we find, how do we find answers? How do we not be afraid to take the risk? How do we allow ourselves, our discursive thoughts to be ex expressed and explored in a world where there is so much emphasis on substantiating every single thing that you do, where you are so concerned about the review that you're going to read in the newspaper the next day, your reputation, all of these other contingent factors? How, 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 what is, what space do we need to create in order to enable us to actually allow for these answers to emerge? I don't know if Reem you, or Aram, Aram. I have, I mean, for me it's quite simply has to do with language and the kind of rehearsed language that continues to be played out in relationship to art and this becoming a quite comfortable zone for people's engagement with it and uh, I find that there is this sense of repetition that is quite safe and that 
that moment of reception, the kind of initial moment of reception, being the one where there's this kind of, I mean, even just the notion of questioning, or think of how many words that are used to describe what one does or what an artwork does, they're tired. Like, they're just not potent anymore. And even if you go to another thesaurus and you look up another word to describe this performative action, you're still uh, asserting that the relationship between an object and an audience is a kind of one-to-one -one because there's a verb that is somehow enacting something. And it's the struggle is to, to dis disconnect from this comfort zone because once you do that, then you don't actually know what, what structure you're inhabiting as a, as a receiver or as a curator or as a writer. And I just find that so often that's the kind of like first uh, thing to disconnect from is maybe just to stop using the cliches uh, of framing uh, and maybe then things can start to happen. But we don't actually know what the terms are. I mean, it's like even in preparing what I wrote uh, today, you know, you, there's this call to kind of like carve out something else, but yet I don't actually know what the thing is. And for me, it's through the act of writing and through the act of kind of uh, description where perhaps there's something embedded within there. And again, in the way in which things unfold according to different logics of time, it may not reveal itself within my lifetime. And I would count on the fact, I mean, this is like where I'm getting way delusions of grandeur, but maybe someone would read something that I wrote later and have a better sense of what I had to say than I myself understood. I have two things that I want to talk about. The one thing about this also, there's this kind of this idea always of like, you can look at artwork for 30 seconds, you need to look for hours as if like it appears. Sometimes it's, you know, I also sometimes want to question that in the sense that even in a weekend like this or a week long thing like this, you have chance meetings, have conversations on the corners, have a cigarette with somebody and that actually starts to vibrate answers or things that, you know, do. Also, I think we also need to let accidents and inconvenience in our life to happen and give time to that. Um, for example, when people went with Bas to Claire's performances she created, you know, there was a moment where the, the, the drivers went for prey and then there was this moment of waiting for them. You know, it's a part of being in the culture, being in this time and experiencing that time and having that kind of inefficient, uncomfortable time. But I think, you know, that's a, that opens up things. That's, you know, when your life is so, you know, smooth or like kind of, you know, that's, I don't think you kind of get answers. These kind of cracks or incidences or inconveniences are things that we should also, you know, give attention. And I think sometimes like I see an artwork for 30 seconds that I was driving in a, you know, bus and kind of sometimes gives more like meaning because I saw it for such a long time. I'm um, so such a short time that I start making like these dreams about it. Like I give so much meaning to it random that it's also a creative act. So I think those things are, you know, also like, you know, places that we should have value. Yep. Reem, do you uh, want to respond to Omar? I, I'm, I'm not sure I know how to respond uh, to your question. Uh, I think basically there is a formula and I'm hoping that there's a formula in what we're trying to do as artists and practitioners um, investigating with communities, with people. Um, I, I'm interested in what you were saying about being contingent, but not as, uh, not as like, not as seeing a break, right? Because we are contingent. Our, our, the way we manifest in life is contingent. You do not break from you know, your personal life, you don't break from the way you sit with the chair and then the chair affects your back and then how you respond, how the lights kind of attack your body and how you're formulating your ideas and responding to others around you. This is this kind of embodied contingent situation. And hence, if we take that as a kind of fait accompli and we move with it in terms of how we produce knowledge and we produce things around us, 
then you know, there is a level of responsibility, coming back to the first notion, of responding to things, to other people, and to situations around us. And that becomes a, an underlying, it, it's how we operate, it's how we should operate. And, and for me, that, is a, that has been a, a, a guiding formula. And I, and I am intrigued to see specific new discourses in art, uh, new or maybe they've always been there and they're resurging, that are um, thinking about effectivity in society, looking at producing, uh, uh, I mean, not to call you out, but like Lawrence Abu Hamdan's work specifically for me that is bringing in materials that are affecting specific lives and laws and evidence, can we really push the realm of art to be on that level of, of effectivity? Can it, can it go that far? These possibilities are really, I mean, for me, they're eye openers. I wanna see more of that. I wanna see more of that kind of communal, collective articulation that has an effective discourse for society. Um, how does that then translate into also a moment of poesia, right? Moments of Eureka uh, and inspiration for people to think beyond their references. I mean, it, it's an, everything that every artist that has produced something has then contributed to this world and then pushes this discourse even further. I don't see that as, I think everything is an amalgamation we don't arrive at one. And there is that kind of collective effort, that material collective effort that arrives at that. So it's an important thing to see it that way. Um, I think we are indulgent. And it is something to be said uh, and acknowledged that we are living in a sense of indulgence and this travel and <laughs> the footprint and all of that. I think a level of how do we there is a real question that is beckoning at us to break that indulgence and allow that level to feed forward in other dimensions around us. I think that is something that we're seeing. Okay, I think we do have a question, but Zoe, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to say that I really was happy to hear you say that Okay, on one hand, you're tired of asking questions, but I really appreciated when you said you want something tangible in response. And there's an urgency, I think, today for tangibility because that is denied across so much of the globe, particularly when it comes to culture. For me, when I try to be practical, I think I say to artists, don't sit still. Don't sit in a blank space and assuming a blank space. Experiment. Don't not make, produce. And it's something as simple as cooking, going out with someone, conversations, getting critical. I think the fundamental answer to the need for tangibility is action. And as curators, I think, or as architects, that's the most simplest tangibility that we can nurture. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I don't know, just uh, like two phrases have been coming across my mind during this whole discussion is, you know, waste of time and time is money. And, and we all share the same 24 hours, right? So the question of the actual talk, making new time. But my question is, what are your thoughts on like wasting time? You know, what's the value of wasting time. I know, slightly provocative, but I'd be interested to hear one or all of you say something about it. Thank you. That's a really, I just had an image in my mind. When I first moved to Southeast Asia, I um, spent a lot of time between Cambodia and Vietnam and was struck by the number of people who would just stand still on a public street. Particularly in Phnom Penh, I would find people who were um, rickshaw drivers 
and they would literally stand like statues as if they were not living. And I found a similar kind of symptom occurring in Vietnam where people would sit on sidewalks with cups of coffee and plastic cups and it would be as if they're statues who haven't touched that cup of coffee in at least an hour. And then I started working with artists and realized if you think that something is going to get done in an hour, forget it, it'll take four. At first it was quite frustrating because what I'm seeing is a lack of movement. But then when I started to work with and become a part of these communities, I realized there's a lot happening in that visibility of stasis a lot up here. And I think that that idea of waste is too much anchored in what we are perceiving with the eye. But in actuality, that stillness is a lot of busyness. And I, want, I think even I would suggest that we don't sit still enough. So we need to move the eye away from the defining waste. I'm just going to say the opposite way, but at the same point, but you know, when I moved to New York City, there is this kind of constant running. Like, you know, like everybody's like busy, everybody's running. Like there's this idea of like, if I'm running around and I'm busy, I'm worth something. Um, that there's never a kind of stepping back and looking well, what one produced or what that meant or why. So there's actually also a lot of waste in running around that I see in New York City that after, you know, once you are, I mean, it's exhausting. It's not productive, so I think again this kind of also it's you know this idea of like being busy is being productive is I think that's also something that we should start disengaging, you know. And I, I agree. I mean that's like you know anyway. Follow on that point, I would say it's not the wasting of time as much as it's owning time. The, the most important thing is to understand that that there is that material dimension to it, and you own it. And daydreaming is a beautiful thing, by the way. So I, I salute the coffee standers and bystanders that own their time and are not rushing like New York uh, to expend time or expunge it. I would just add one last thing. With, in the, through the figure of Huguette Kaland, where someone, if you can use her as an example, who by and large for artists that she had befriended in Los Angeles, that she had worked alongside, that had characterized her work during uh, you know, her most active time as being a waste of time because it was seen as being uh, too intellectual for a context that is known, uh, unfortunately, for its anti-intellectualism. Uh, and how, in fact, there's something quite inspiring about this uh, endurance within the face of, of waste, uh, of, of the accusation of wasting time, and how some that, somehow that could be kind of ingrained into the work uh, that was produced over a kind of 50 year period, uh, deliberately to kind of reorient her own relationship uh, to this demand. Maybe also one more thing about that. Oh, there's we have one more question up here. Yep. Hi, um, Cinta from Brussels. I was sensing around uh, the question of fear, um, fear of non longevity, non directional, non tangible, non constructible, non formable, and so forth. And of all of that as being part of it all as well as existing and the possibility of exactly that fear creating um, blind spots as we are focused on it uh, to try to find the source or the question or even the answer to it. So this kind of line or tunnel we're in with a direct um, relation that blinds us from looking elsewhere. So would it be able that those blight spots can be revealed by something as trust where we can trust to leave the echo chamber to re release a certain type of karma that has been uh, obsessing us that was a little bit my sense and um, question or 
observation. The Bible says that there, I don't know if there's a fear for people to come out of the echo chamber. I don't think so. There's a comfort being in the echo chamber. That I, I mean, there's a, you know, it, it's very easy, and you know, I mean, there's a comfort to it that actually is the, probably the hardest thing to. That's why not because I'm fear for I'm fearing that I'm stepping out is not so much that I'm so comfortable. No, and I think it's more, yeah, it's people really do want to stay in the echo chamber. It is comfortable. It is what you know. Um, anyone else? Uh, or maybe another, another way of looking at it is what would you want to see outside of the echo chamber? What would you want to find? Because we've talked a lot about leaving it, but what are we leaving it to do? <laughs> well, it is the end. Yeah, we are going to find the end. Any last comments? That will be then I will give it to you. But one thing that came to my mind, maybe about the echo chamber, this goes to this idea of waste and productivity. Is these are very colonial and like modern and modern like languages. So I, I maybe if we go out of echo chamber, I I hope that we will find new languages that are that we can express ourselves and our lives out of that like that language. <laughs>